gonna go ahead and get started here. So thank you everybody for coming to the CISL CGD Joint Seminar. Today we have Dr. Paige Martin from NASA. So Paige is a program scientist with NASA's Transform to Open Science Initiative in the Chief Science Data Office. She envisions a future of inclusive, transparent, and robust scientific research and believes that open science frameworks are the best tools to achieve this vision. She did her PhD in physical oceanography at the University of Michigan and her postdoc in climate data science at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. She has years of, tech, of scientific and technical expertise at, in large scale data analysis, open source software, and cloud computing. In addition, she has helped lead open science communities, including running hack weeks and capacity sharing activities in multiple countries. She also enjoys doing musical theater and singing about science. So, <laughs> so questions about that later. <laughs> so today she's gonna to be talking about transforming to open science, how NASA is adopting and enabling open science practices. So thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. That was quite, quite the introduction. Um, I have not planned to sing today, but I do have a song that I like to sing about open science. So we'll see how it goes. If you want it at the end, you can request it. Um, so I, you can see the title I actually shifted it a little bit here because I will talk um, a lot about what NASA is doing, but I also will offer some of my own perspectives after I take my NASA hat off to address some of the questions uh, that were um, kind of asked of me being here. So anyway, thank you all. This is really fun to be here. I've always heard how amazing NCAR is, and this is my first time being here. So it's really fun. I already took a walk uh, in some of the trails. It's amazing. Okay, so you already heard my introduction, but I think it's important with what I'm going to say today, especially when I offer some of my own perspectives of uh, where I'm coming from. So I was a physical oceanographer. Uh, as was mentioned, I did my PhD at the University of Michigan. I worked exclusively with idealized ocean atmosphere models. Um, there's one of them. This was the quasi-geostrophic coupled model. Um, that was really great. I then did my postdoc at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, um, and I did it in climate data science, still largely in the physical oceanography space. Uh, and I actually used an NCAR data set. I used CESM. I was looking at air-sea interaction. Um, there is one of my, my figures in, in the paper that I'm still trying to publish, because that's how it goes. Um, so, uh, so, so that was uh, my postdoc. Then in November, I started at NASA as a program scientist or support scientist in the Chief Science Data Office, which I'll talk a bit more about later. It's also pretty new at NASA. Uh, and I work with NASA TOPS, the Transform to Open Science Initiative. I also with, work with the Open Source Science Initiative, which is OSSI. And you will also see that NASA really likes acronyms. So I've done my best to spell them out when I can, but if they're not spelled out, you probably don't really need to know it for this talk. Um, so I think other than um, these kind of jobs that I have, I also want to uh, say that I'm part of some community efforts. So one of those is Pangeo, which I think many of you are very familiar with. Uh, it's a community for big data geoscience. Um, we are a, a community that's really kind of obsessed with, with data processing. Um, we've developed a kind of Pangeo stack of the software that's often used in the geo and climate sciences. And we really work with like interoperable software. Um, we also have some infrastructure um, that really allowed for scientific computing in the cloud that's really been adopted much more, more widely. So that's kind of Pangeo in a nutshell. I'm also part of the Open Source Science uh, Initiative. Uh, separate from, this is not the NASA one, which is, has a very similar name. Um, but this is a community that uh, in many ways is trying to do a lot of what Pangeo does, but across all of the sciences. And so really trying to put kind of science users and software developers in the same space. Um, they have a few kind of um, vertical interest groups that are for a few different sciences. We're hoping to expand that. And then we have kind of cross-cutting uh, interest groups on the reproducibility, um, mapping out science. Um, and these kind of things. And so this is through NumFocus. It's just getting started this year. So um, these are also really important to me and have helped shaped, shape kind of my perspective on open science and what I do. Okay, so I also like to start with kind of how I came into open science. Um, and looking back, I think there are kind of three main events that happened uh, that really led me to 
promote and champion open science. So the first step was accessibility. I used MATLAB in undergrad. That was all I knew. Um, that's what I did in classes. I then did a year of research in Germany before I started at grad school. And the institute I was at in Germany did not have personal MATLAB licenses. I would travel across Berlin to get to the library so I could use the machines there so I could do my homework in MATLAB. Luckily, I had some German colleagues who were like, this is silly. You should spend this year learning Python. And I said, OK, because I didn't know. Uh, and I am so glad that they had me do that. <laughs> um, so I have really nothing against MATLAB, but I lost access. It was a lot less convenient. I started Python, and I've never looked back. So secondly is scalability. So I, in, even in my PhD, when I was doing idealized models, um, I was running them for a very long amount of time, and I was doing frequency domain analysis where I needed the entire time series to actually do the analysis. This means I was dealing with really large amounts of data, even though it was idealized and regional. Um, and I still was running into memory issues. Um, so I kind of stumbled across uh, someone who's now part of the Pangeo community who said, you should be using these open source tools like X-Ray and Dask. They will really help, uh, help you do, do your research. So the scalability, these open source tools really allowed me to scale up my research, which was necessary then and even more necessary in my postdoc when I was using high resolution global data. Um, oh, there we go. I had a, a little image for you. So uh, we all know this for using like, large multi-dimensional data sets. This was one of my equations. You don't have to know what it means, but it's basically to show that it was really complex and I was doing a lot of um, computing. Uh, so the third one is inclusion. So this is where I witnessed firsthand how incredible open source and importantly free software removed barriers to doing science. So I'm just going to go into this a little bit. I think some of you have seen me present this because I've shown it at a few um, presentations. This here is Mumin Oladipo. Uh, he's one of my colleagues. He's from Nigeria. He's finishing up his PhD and he's also at the same time, a lecturer at a university in Nigeria. I met him through the Coastal Ocean Environment Summer School in Ghana, something I've been involved with since 2017, and uh, has really shaped uh, how much I champion Python and open source software. So Mumin came to our school in 2018, uh, and it was our first year uh, in Python. We, it was a one-week school, so we're not really teaching much. But in that week, we were able to get uh, his, uh, a data set that he had collected, loaded into his computer in Python. We got Python installed, his data loaded, and plotted. That's all we were able to do in one week. And he stood up and cheered. He was so excited. He'd never been able to do that on his own computer. So I, the next year, he came back and he said, Python has been so great. Let me tell you this story. So this is a quote uh, from him. Uh, and he said, instrumentation is a challenge in developing countries because of poor power supply, technical know-how, and access to sensors uh, and other components. So research is being impeded. Upon learning Python programming at this uh, summer school that I mentioned, I was able to construct a reliable, very low frequency receiver to collect solar flare data for my PhD work. Uh, he set up a device, and that device uh, is a, actually, it's been longer than a year, um, has been going for several years now. I think this last paragraph is what's really interesting. Hitherto, I was using a desktop for the data collection, but the desktop consumes about 300 watts, which was beyond my budget for power backup. Consequently, the Raspberry Pi setup solves the problem of power. It consumes less than 10 watts. Therefore, our budget on power backup was sufficient. The project was a success, and I had configured a similar system at these other universities. So basically what happened, he was setting up instrumentation to take in solar flare data. He was using a desktop because the only tool that he knew at the time was Excel, which required a desktop to run. Once he learned Python, actually once he learned about Python, he taught himself Python. He realized that he could use Python to program a Raspberry Pi, so a very small computer, uh, which took a lot less power than a desktop, and he was able to set up the instrumentation. I just really like this story because it's not something that I would have thought of from my background, but open source software, having something that's more widely used um, that's more interoperable across different devices uh, was, was incredibly powerful and enabled his science. So those were kind of my three pathways into open science. So 
with all of that in mind, now I'm going to put my NASA hat really firmly on uh, and talk about NASA's open source, uh, open source science strategy. Uh, side note, for this talk, I will be using open source science and open science pretty much interchangeably. But at NASA, we, we use both, actually. Um, you will see this. So, uh, so here we go. So our definition of open science, this is a federally adopted definition from the US federal government. It's that open science is the principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy, and fostering collaborations, reproducibility, and equity. So I think many of us are probably familiar. We're talking about open science, the sharing of our code, the sharing of our data, um, making our results public publicly accessible. And I think this definition really highlights that it's not just the products, it's not just what we're sharing, it's that practice, it's the principle of doing our science. But it also uh, says that it's really important we're not just sharing all of our science, we're thinking about how to do that respectfully. Um, we're thinking about how to do that in a secure way that, that protects privacy. So this is one of our, our adopted definition of open science. So a bit of background of kind of why the Chief Science Data Office uh, exists and what we're doing. So starting in 2019, um, there was, oh, I put this later, SMD stands for Science Mission Directorate. Um, it's used very heavily at NASA. Basically, it's across all of the science divisions of NASA. Um, and they wrote this strategy for data management and computing for groundbreaking science. And they basically wrote out a lot of uh, the aspects of open science that we now uh, are promoting. And uh, this is part of how the Chief Science Data Office came about. In August 2022, there was a memo from the uh, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP. Uh, and that said that basically they were stating that we should be ensuring free, immediate, and equitable access to federally funded research. Um, so this is a pretty big deal. Uh, a lot of agencies have been responding to this in the last year or so. Uh, and then last year, uh, near the end of the year, uh, we uh, published a policy called, again, we love our acronyms. This is the very catchy title of SPD41A, which supersedes SPD41. So um, this is kind of our, our policy for um, all of the science divisions at NASA, and it really stipulates how we are expecting uh, NASA-funded researchers to adhere to open science practices, and I'll talk more about that. So in the Chief Science Data Office, we have kind of three main goals. We're really all about open science, so how can we really enable open science? Uh, the second goal is um, looking at the actual data and computing systems and making sure that um, they are kind of up to snuff, that they are um, you know, supporting the research uh, that uh, scientists would like to do. Um, and then also we're looking at community. We want to foster the community, um, uh, in our scientific community, and specifically in open science. So here's a nice inspiring quote um, before I dive into some of the specifics. Unity is a strength. When there is teamwork and collaboration, wonderful things can be achieved. So let's look at what wonderful things have been achieved. So I like to throw these in. These are just examples of, of open science. Um, this is one where open data enabled new science. So, um, and I particularly like this one because I really like birds. <laughs> um, so this is an example. Um, this was, uh, there is a NOAA data set of NEXRAD radar data. Um, it's been around for a long time. It was stored on tapes back in the day. Um, which is how it was done. Uh, more recently, they put it onto the cloud, which made it suddenly much more accessible to different communities. And what they found was that the different communities, not just the meteorological community, were finding it really useful. Uh, and one of those was a NASA-funded study that looked at birds. As it turns out, purple martins, which you can see in the corner there, they form this huge roosting um, uh, kind of behavior where there are like tens to hundreds of thousands of birds. Several of us at SciPy went to see these birds in Austin, so um, they're pretty cool. And you can actually see them on the radar. So that's what these little circles are. So uh, this was an entirely different type of scientific study that was enabled because they made this data openly accessible. So I think that's a great, uh, a great example. Um, Got to have a good space example from NASA. Um, so this is the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, the, the James Webb did an early release of data. Um, 
that was planned. And so there's a big community effort that said, we know that this early release is coming. Let's all work together and see what incredible new discoveries we can, we can find. So I think when they wrote this you know, proposal first, they were like, oh, we, we hope for a handful of publications. Um, they ended up getting more than 40 publications. Um, and one of them was really interesting. It was they found carbon dioxide for the first time on an exoplanet. So we have this fun, catchy title, you know, first step toward discovering life on another planet. We haven't discovered that yet. But if there is carbon dioxide, that, you know, it is a first step. So, um, so this was another one, making that, doing that early release of data. Uh, but not only that, but having this truly collaborative, I think there were thousands of, uh, of scientists that really worked together um, to get a lot of publications out right away and, and kind of get this, this science um, out into the public as soon as possible. So those are some, some examples of open science. Um, now I'll go into some of uh, what we are doing in the Chief Science Data Office. So our main initiative is called the Open Source Science Initiative. And so that's how we're trying to put open science into practice. We also love QR codes. So you will see QR codes throughout. So if you're a QR code person, be ready. Um, so there are kind of four pillars um, to the Open Source Science Initiative. So the first is the policy and government governance side. So this is kind of what I mentioned before, our really ca uh, catchy title of SPD41A. We're putting out policies. And the idea is that we're helping guide scientists um, to doing their work in more of an open way. We're also looking at the data and computing services. Um, so this is um, kind of looking across NASA um, specifically, what's in common, how can we really best enable research by providing um, computing and data services. We're also looking at incentives. I think really a lot of these comes down to incentives. Um, how can we make sure we're incentivizing open science? Um, we give out grants, and some of our grants uh, are uh, specifically on open science. Um, but we're also looking at how to make sure that we're taking into account open science activities in our grants and grant review processes. Um, what prizes and challenges can we, can we start to make sure that open, you know, people have been really um, fundamental to the open science movement are getting the recognition that they deserve? And then uh, last but certainly not least is the community engagement side, which is where TOPS, the Transform to Open Science Initiative, sits. So I'm going to just touch on each of these briefly. So for the policy and governance side, we have our um, SPD41A policy. Um, so basically, this policy is covering kind of all of the aspects of a scientific workflow. Um, and the goal is to make NASA science as open as possible. We have this, you can see this, as open as possible, as, re as restricted as required, and always secure. It's one of our mottos. Um, so there are a few specifics. Um, one thing to note is it is forward looking. So when we implement policies, we always get people who have current grants and say, oh no, I can't do this. We're like, nope, that's fine. This is for all you know, new grants moving forward. Um, and so here, these policy updates, i just give you an example of what's in there. So uh, for example, peer-reviewed publications must be made openly available with no embargo period. So this basically, as, uh, as soon as it's published, it should be publicly available. Um, we realize that there are some barriers to this, like the cost of publishing open access in many journals. So our advice right now is that uh, you can apply for the funding that you need to make your work open access. Um, we also are asking uh, that all of the research data and software are shared at the time of publication or at the end of the funding award, whichever occurs first. Um, oh, we also have the kind of similar for mission data that should be released as soon as possible. There's often calibration that needs to happen. Um, and then we also address kind of meetings and conferences that they should be held in as open a way as possible. So that's kind of an example of our policy. So on the core data and computing services side, um, this is something that's really actively in development, so I don't have a lot of specifics for this. Um, but really what it says here, we have this layered architecture. So we're trying to kind of look across NASA, which NASA is very large, and each division and each center kind of often does their own thing. So we're trying to now unify across that, which is a pretty big task, as it turns out. Um, and so that's what really it says here, like SMD-wide, so all of, all of the science that's, that's being done at NASA, um, and trying to develop those, those services. Um, so one example here um, in, uh, under the services uh, umbrella is trying to make NASA data more findable. So this is something called the Science, data, uh, science Discovery Engine. It is uh, still in beta, um, so it's, it's not quite there yet. But 
Um, this is something that's basically trying to be one place where you can go and search through all of NASA's data sets. It's not just data as well. I think it's largely, largely data at this point, but um, other things uh, associated with it, maybe blog posts, other things like that. Um, this is something where when I first heard about it, when I joined, I thought, wow, that seems like a really obvious thing to do. But again, when you have all of these different systems across <laughs> NASA, that's actually really difficult just to have something that makes the data findable. So um, this is actually quite a, a big effort, uh, and it's just one of the examples of what we're, we're trying to make uh, data, NASA data more fair, and this is the findable part of, of fair data. So in, on the incentive side, um, one of the big things we do, we are a funding agency, we provide funding, and we do provide funding for a lot of open source tools here. Um, so a lot of the software packages seen here have, have had NASA funding. Um, here I list a couple that are open right now um, that I think might be most relevant to all of you. I will be sharing these slides. Um, so, um, and I will note that the middle one is not open yet, but will be opening soon. Uh, and you can read, read through some of those. I'm happy to discuss those further. Uh, okay, on to the community engagement, which is the top side. So as NASA's really looking ahead, we have a lot of big challenges coming, and we, we believe that we need more we science rather than me science. So we need to work collectively, and this is really where the community comes in. We need more people, more hands, more eyes, more brains that have diverse experiences so that we can make sure we're asking the right questions and also getting the best solutions. So this is where Transform to Open Science, or TOPS, comes in. Um, it's a five-year mission to accelerate adoption of open science. So we have three goals, to increase the understanding and adoption of open science, uh, to broaden participation in historically excluded communities, and to accelerate major scientific discoveries. So we're doing all of this um, through engagement, uh, capacity sharing, incentives, and coordination, and I'll touch on these. So on the engagement side, um, this is kind of a, a list of some of what we're doing. Um, we have monthly community forums. We have online discussions. Uh, we have a Slack group. If anyone's interested in joining, um, let me know. Um, you can read about some of the open science success stories that we've gathered from the community. Um, so this is part of our engagement strategy. Of course, a big one is um, doing events, and you might have seen us at conferences this year. We're really going big on conferences uh, this year. Um, on the uh, capacity sharing side, we are introducing a curriculum called Open Science 101, which is really meant to be an introduction to open science. And it comes in five modules. The first one is really, what is open science? Why are we talking about it? What's so important about it? That's the ethos of open science. And we kind of follow roughly like steps of a, of a scientific workflow. Um, and the idea of this is, is so that all scientists will have kind of a base knowledge of what open science is and what the tools are. So um, why would you want to take Open Science 101? Um, it's, it's a community-developed uh, curriculum. Um, it will do things like uh, help you write data management plans. At NASA, we now, it's called Open Science and Data Management Plan, OSDMP. So we're going to be addressing that, what's expected in these kinds of things. Um, what are the tools? making sure everyone has uh, things like orchids, um, and of course, growing a, a, this community of open science practitioners. Um, and you do get a, a badge and a certificate when you finish, and actually each module you'll get a little badge. Um, so you know, we're trying to make it fun, and you can then you know, share those on, on your digital, in your digital presence. So again, we like QR codes. Um, so you can pre-register here. Um, they're not available yet, but they're, um, they're in testing phase at the moment. So um, we're hoping they'll be out by probably the beginning of next year, um, and would love community feedback on those too. Um, so TOPS is looking at on the incentive side. So we're looking at establishing awards that honor um, open science. Uh, again, we have badges, I just mentioned that. Um, prizes and challenges, and then recognition. So making sure that open science practices, which often take a lot of time, are recognized as valid parts of people's jobs and in um, their hiring or, or um, uh, promotion reviews and things like that. So on the coordination side, um, TOPS and NASA has really led the way um, in a year of open science. So this year is a year of open science. I don't know if you knew that. Um, 
The White House uh, jumped on board pretty quickly, and you can see there are 15 other US federal agencies that have joined. Uh, this number keeps growing, so it's, it's really exciting. Um, and so basically, these are, um, this is a group of people at, across the agencies that meet twice, uh, sorry, once every two weeks um, to discuss what they are doing at their agency to promote open science. So there are four goals in association with this. You can read more about it on the website. Um, and so the, these agencies have had to agree to these goals, uh, and they you know, are talking at a very high level about how they're instituting the policy, how they're handling different situations. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's pretty neat to have representatives across 15 agencies spend you know, an hour of time every two weeks talking about open science. Okay, I am now gonna take my NASA hat off. So that was kind of what we're doing at NASA. Now I wanna just offer um, some, some of my perspective and opinions on, on open science. And so this is meant to be very informal. Uh, I'm hoping that you, know, you will agree with some and maybe disagree with some of what I say and then we can have a great discussion. Um, so I'm kind of just calling this part portion the open science landscape. And this is actually a photo I took a few days ago when I was in northern Colorado staying at a cabin in the mountains. So amazing, it's an amazing state. Um, so this is also just an excuse for me to shut up. Uh, and I'll just emphasize that my NASA head is off here. This is my perspective. So from, from here moving forward, this is just, just me based on discussions I've had and my background. Um, so I was asked when I came here to address two questions. So here are the two questions. How can an NSF FFRDC like NCAR participate in and support broader community open science efforts? And the second was how can NCAR's HPC environment complement activities that are evolving on the commercial cloud? These are excellent questions that don't necessarily have easy answers. And so I may not actually answer any, either of these questions, but I'm hoping to offer some perspective and so that we can have these discussions. That's probably the theme of the rest of this talk. I won't really answer any questions, but I will talk about them. So like any good scientist, I want to start off with stating my assumptions. And these questions are very much about NCAR, and I don't know a lot about NCAR. I figure almost everyone in this room knows more about NCAR than I do. So this is what I see as NCAR from my experience, and so this is what I will be talking about when I'm talking about NCAR moving forward. So NCAR uh, is a great institute that has been and continues to be a world leader in the atmospheric and climate science communities. So when I was going through grad school, I, was, I idolized NCAR. I was like, what an amazing place, um, and I still do. Um, it has fantastic supercomputing facilities. That's been a big part of uh, its, its history, providing these incredible um, computational facilities. Uh, it develops and runs climate models. So I was using an NCAR run climate model for my postdoc work. Uh, and it employs a lot of scientists. And I'm using scientists in the very broad term here to include people who are doing the research, people who are doing the software development, people who are uh, managing the data sets, all of these kind of inclusive in this kind of scientific ecosystem. So I expect that I was invited here because there has been this push toward open science. I just told you what NASA is doing, the White House, all these other agencies. Um, we've got AGU this year. The theme is wide open science. We have these communities I mentioned, open source science, Pangeo is all about open science. There's the Center for Open Science. We have these data and software repositories. There's just a lot about open science right now. So we're seeing this really big push toward open science. Um, I think that this is, again, my perspective, oops, sorry, um, that open science is actually what science really set out to be from the beginning. But there were constraints in the past that are no longer the case. So one example is that computing resources were few and far between. So as part of this talk, I just briefly looked up a little history of NCAR. It's pretty fun. Uh, so NCAR opened in 1960. Again, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. You probably all know this. Um, and in 1963, it got its first supercomputer called CDC 3600. Um, and that's what's pictured here. Um, and it had one processor. And on the website, I think it rounds to the nearest terabyte of memory. And so it had zero memory. Um, <laughs> That was fun. Um, so, um, but at the time, that was really incredible. Um, this was one of the very few institutes that had this kind of technology uh, and these facilities for the scientific community. That's a really big deal. Um, another example of this is how we disseminate scientific knowledge. This used to be much harder in the past because we didn't have the internet. We didn't even necessarily really have computers for a while. Um, so the 
um, what had to be done was you had to print out these journals, and then they had to be delivered to a library and then put in a library, and people could go there. Um, that made sense at the time. That was probably the best way to do it. Well, we could debate that, but that's what was done. Um, and that limits people. It limits people who have access to the library, who can actually physically walk into the library, all of these things. Um, so a lot has changed since then. Um, we are now in a very digital world. Again, very obvious statement. Um, but I think it's really worth emphasizing. We have the internet. We all have our personal computers. We have literally computation at our fingertips when we're holding our phones that are much more powerful than, I think, NCAR's first supercomputer. Um, we, have, uh, we, can, we can obtain our, our articles and, and um, journals through the websites. Um, so it's just everything is much more accessible. So things have really changed. We also have a lot more computational science, part of, partly because it's a lot more accessible. We have more people doing science. We have more, uh, more comp computational resources. We have really big data sets. Um, and so all of these are kind of factoring into we are changing how we are doing science. Uh, and in some ways, some of the institutions haven't been you know, keeping up. But the fact of the matter is we are changing how we're doing science, kind of by necessity. So I'm calling this this paradigm shift in how we're doing science. And I think one way to think about this is, so in the past, we've had, um, we've kind of worked at our university or institute or agency, and it has been very much um, kind of a siloed community um, within, uh, between the universities or between the institutes. Whereas if you're at a university, you get access to the computational facilities, you get access to their journal articles, uh, whatever subscriptions they have, all of that kind of thing. And it's really dictated kind of from the top down. Here's what we're doing. Um, you're working at our supercomputer. Here, here's how you do that. You have you know, all, all of this kind of thing. Um, I think this is changing. And what we're seeing instead is that we're seeing a lot of these Oh, it did not change on my computer. Interesting. Um, these grassroots efforts, so these open science communities, some of which I've already mentioned, um, oh, the open source software. And I'm showing it like this because they're really cutting across institutions and universities and agencies. And they're largely grouped around things like the scientific discipline. What type of data are we using? How is it structured? How can we read in that data? What type of analysis are we doing? And these are largely grassroots, I think, because the scientists who were doing, doing research really weren't finding what they needed necessarily at their institute, at their university. And so they were reaching out. We have forums online, Stack Overflow, discourse forums. People were connecting through these uh, other communication uh, sources and finding others who were having the same trouble. Say, oh, I'm having the same trouble accessing this data, and my university doesn't have this, or uh, you know, things like that. So I mean, it was really out of necessity. Um, uh, we are seeing these kind of cross-cutting communities pop up. And so this is how a lot of the tools that I have you know, based my research on, like X-Array, Dask, Czar, um, these were all kind of community-developed open source software. These largely were not dictated by the big institutions. So I think this is kind of framing a lot of how I'm thinking about um, the next few slides of what we're doing. So I think this is just a really important thing to remember. Uh, and it's important for universities and institutes to see this, that things are shifting, that you know, scientists were craving something, something new, and they kind of started making it themselves. So I think we're shifting into a more bottom-up. How can the institutes, the agencies, the universities support these efforts that are clearly um, what the community really wants to do? OK. So now the question, what can institutes or universities or agencies uh, do to support this paradigm shift toward open science? And the first thing I will say is it is really hard. So I was asked, oh, what, N what can NCAR do in this space? Um, I think every agency and institute and university is asking themselves this question and is trying to figure this out. So this, this, is, this is really difficult. Um, and so I'm offering some some suggestions here. I really hope you all have some more. I'm sure there's a lot, there's, there will be a lot that I'm not talking about here. So anyway, just kind of saying that. Um, OK, so I have to, I'm just full of caveats. Um, I think NCAR is already ahead of the curve um, and supporting open science in many ways. So I've accessed data from the Climate Data Gateway that was free. I could access the data. Um, 
NCL, they're like developing software that's open source that the community can use. Uh, I have this little image of the YubiKey, which I used back in the day when I was a grad student. I had no association, and I wrote to NCAR, was like, I'd like to access your data. And they were like, here you go, here's a YubiKey, and now you can access it. So, you know, it's maybe not as accessible as we'd like nowadays, but it was accessible in many ways. I was just a random grad student. Uh, you gave me access to your supercomputer. So, um, so anyway, NCAR is really uh, much further along this path than, than a lot of um, groups that I talk with. So my first suggestion is really, and a lot of these will focus on the software side, because that's kind of where I'm largely interested in, um, it's pay software engineers to contribute to community tools. So this might sound kind of obvious, um, but I think this is one of the best ways that universities, institutes, agencies can contribute to the open source communities. So, um, let's see, I have a little list here of what this does. So this is a really direct positive impact on the scientific community. So I'm talking about a lot of these tools, X-Ray, Dask, Czar, that's kind of the base of the Pangeo stack, it'll be my example today. These are used very widely by the community. So by helping to maintain these tools, to add new features, to fix bugs, you are actively having a positive impact on the community. A lot of these tools rely on volunteer effort to keep them maintained. This is one of the biggest struggles for the open source community. If we have institutes that, are, you know, that have uh, software engineers that are paid to work on this, this will really alleviate this reliance on volunteer time, which is a big risk for the scientific community. Me as a user, this is a risk that I see. So it ensures long-term maintenance of community tools. Um, I think it's also really great for institutes or universities. Um, you're building expertise in these widely used community tools. And so then people will be you know, coming to you and saying, we, you know, we want your expertise, we want your help with this. Um, and really importantly, it kind of encourages collaboration with the scientific community rather than creation of new tools. So it'll make sure that the software engineers are staying up to date with the tools, how the community is using them, instead of kind of reinventing something because they just weren't aware of it because their job is not to help with these community tools but to develop you know, new things specific to, to an institute or university. So um, there are probably a lot more things I could say here, but I think this is one of my, my biggest uh, points. So another one is to account for open science activities in reviews and evaluations. So I mentioned this is something that we're doing uh, through NASA TOPS as well, and we're kind of starting at NASA and trying to, to figure out how we can make wording more clear, um, but make sure that if you, you know, have contributed to an open source package that you are honored for that. So here are just some examples, kind of from the top of my head. Um, if you're regularly involved in a community, um, maybe you're really helping organize the events, that takes a lot of time, but it's really important and it really supports the scientific community. That should be taken into account when you're getting reviewed for a promotion or whatever. Um, you're adding metadata, you're documenting your code, fixing bugs, all of these things should be accounted for. So this is just something that, you know, maybe you already do this, that would be great. I'm certainly not saying NCAR doesn't because I don't know, um, but I think it's something that's really important to think about. So on the same side, I, I, I was thinking about what are some concerns and challenges for investing in community software. So as I said, I'm kind of focusing on the software side. Um, and then I have some responses for, for that. So, one of the concerns is that it's too risky. I kind of mentioned this before, um, that the sustainability of open source software is very often an open question because, again, we're relying on volunteer time. Um, this, this is an XKCD, which you may be familiar with, where we have all of our modern infrastructure, and it's just like hinging on this like wobbly block at the bottom. Um, so I guess, again, my kind of personal response to this is that institutes that already hire software engineers can actually play a really big role in de-risking this situation for their own institute, but also for the entire scientific community. If there are people who are paid to do this, they can spend time building more blocks at the bottom, just making sure that that won't fall over. Um, and, and really kind of, uh, yeah, providing this like de-risk, which is also de-risking for the community at the institute, because a lot of these tools are widely used by people, so um, by, at all of these institutes and universities. So, um, so yeah, that's my response to that. Um, one concern is that community tools may not be optimized or best suited for a given institute's infrastructure or the data sets and that kind of thing. 
And I think this is, it's, it, this is a really valid concern. You know, maybe there's some community tools, but it's just not like quite right for working with your data set or the type of infrastructure that you have. Um, and so I guess my response to that is interoperability is key. Um, I think instead of saying, well, we'll just write our own tool, that might make sense. But I think the first thing is, what can I add to an existing tool that would make it be optimized for my data set or infrastructure? And again, it's very easy to say. It can often be very difficult to do this. Um, but it, it means, I think we really need to focus on the user and have the user be first. And that's where I come from as, as a user of scientific software. If I'm using a piece of software, I'd prefer to keep using that even if I'm switching to a different data set or a different platform. I don't want to have to learn a whole new software set just because I'm switching platforms or I'm trying to analyze a new data set. Um, by adding new features to existing tools, maybe you add something under the hood. So you're still using X-Array, but it has some flag that I can put that uses you know, a specific um, you know, data set feature, um, things like that. So that's, that's, I, I think that's kind of the first step. Um, sometimes it might make sense to build a new tool. And when you do, then I just encourage you to ask, what tool can I build that best integrates with the community adapted software stack that already exists? So um, I mentioned many of us are familiar with the Pangeo software stack. How can we write tools that best integrate with that existing software stack? So maybe I need a new package, but it integrates well with X-Array and Czar, and I can kind of use the tools I'm still familiar with. Um, so one concern and challenge that I don't really have an answer for, funding values novelty. I should probably have said funding overvalues novelty. Um, and so here I'm showing a, a Nobel Prize uh, medal um, where, you know, if you develop this grand new tool, oh, this is great, you might get your funding or your Nobel Prize or whatever. Um, if you just like contribute to the community right at the moment, you're less likely to get that award, to get that funding. And this is a real problem. I raise it here. I'm not sure this is as relevant to institutes and universities. This is probably more for agencies. Um, where, and we are working on that actively at NASA, where we are trying to now value actually more the uh, con contribution to existing tools. There is a blog post that says we should not fund any new software. Um, it's really fun to read. It's very short. You should read it. Um, and I think there's something to that. We shouldn't fund new tools. We should fund tools that have already been adopted by the community. We know that you know, they need the funding that everyone has adopted. It's clearly uh, what the community wants. And we can fund those, make sure that they get the long-term maintenance uh, that they need. So again, this is my personal hat on, not my NASA hat. Um, but we are working on this as well. So um, now I'm going to jump quickly to um, the second question, which is how can NCAR's HPC system support the migration of science toward the cloud? Um, I'm going to start by, maybe many of you have seen this. I just came across this recently and thought it was great. So there is an analogy that cloud is like a herd of cattle where you have a lot of CPUs, a lot of instances. If one kind of dies, that's okay. You can start a new one. You've got so many, it's, that's okay. An HPC is more like a pet where you've carefully curated it. It's the right, you know, has the right environment for uh, you know, the, the users, and it's this kind of nice, nice thing that you've really taken care of. Um, and I point this out because it's kind of fun, but I think that we are certainly aren't saying that we should get rid of herds of, of cattle or that we should get rid of pets. They each have their own uh, benefits, and I, I think that's the same with cloud and HPC. I will say I'm really not an expert at this. So these are some thoughts. You're probably all more experts, and I would welcome discussion. So. Um, the first thing that I will say is um, when asked, you know, oh, well, like HPC versus cloud, um, all of these discussions, is people might want different platforms. Let's make sure that the data can be accessible from whatever platform they're using. So let's make sure our data is ac as accessible as possible from the cloud, um, even if it is on an HPC system. Um, an example of this is open storage network. Now, it is a distributed storage cloud for the research community, but it's not the commercial cloud. It's just a, a, a few servers around the country, like various universities. Um, and so um, one specifically, there's, there's a kind of cluster at the University of Illinois um, that houses a lot of the Pangeo data sets. And this is all at a single facility. So it's basically an HPC system, but they've made it extremely performant for cloud-based workflows. So this is an example of you know, how, this, how this has been done. Um, I think another tool that's really worth pointing out in the space is called Kerchunk. So again, I think many of you 
are familiar with it and may have helped develop this. Um, but it's really cool. Um, it allows for chunked data, so like NetCDF, which I know a lot of the climate model data set, at least um, at NCAR, are, are stored in NetCDF. It allows this chunked data to act like cloud-optimized czar stores. So this is really helpful because when we're on the cloud, we always talk about, well, it needs to be cloud-optimized data, which is true. The way that cl the cloud stores data is very differently than a like, file system. But what Kerchunk has done is it, it has made NetCDF files, which can be stored in a file system, very readable and essentially cloud-optimized, but it actually doesn't touch the data. The data stays NetCDF. It's a layer between the user that tries to access the data. It's just a library layer that doesn't touch this NetCDF. So if I'm on the cloud, oh, sorry, I keep doing that. When I'm on the cloud, I can access this as if it is cloud-optimized data, and I won't know any better. And I don't really care, to be honest. I don't care what format it's in, as long as I can read it in a cloud-optimized way. But if someone else is still using the NetCDF files, doesn't want to use cloud-optimized, that's OK. They can still access the exact same data set. So this is just an, one example of a really impressive tool that's really going to help us transition and allow for this kind of interoperability across platforms. So I hope that we see kind of more tools like this that really allow users to use the platform that they want or that's most convenient um, and kind of allows everyone to, to be happy and to, to have performant workflows. So the other one is you know, leveraging the benefits of HPC. So there are a lot of benefits. Um, again, I'm really not an expert, so I put some thoughts here. Um, so one of them is that it's, you know, it is more like your pet. So it's more robust. It's a more tailored environment to what your user needs. Um, this is really good for running large models when you really want to control that environment, um, when you have really specialized workflows. Um, it also tends to be a lower cost. Now, I actually don't know the details of this, um, especially once you have an HPC system like NCAR, uh, it's lower cost per CPU hour. It tends to be than the cloud. Um, and so this is really good for very long runs. It's, you know, it'll be cheaper. Um, it's also really good for um, runs that don't necessarily need to scale up and down dynamically. That's where the cloud really excels because you can scale up a bunch of nodes as needed and you can just um, scale them back down as soon as you don't need them. And so this is partly why it's more expensive on the cloud. You have this on-demand um, that's really helpful, but not in all situations. So these are just a few, um, a few thoughts, and I'm sure you all have many more. So I'm going to wrap up with some really nice NASA photos because when you're at NASA, you got to use them. So this is the inspiring keep, keep contributing, building, and sustaining your code and infrastructure. Um, thank you for all of your contributions, and thank you for having me here today. How did I do? Okay, really well. Still we have time. about 10 minutes for questions. And for our online audience, um, if you have any questions, please enter them in Slido. Um, should we start with an online question first? Sure, we have one online question from Joseph Gum. Does NASA have an H index or other measure of impact analog for software or software maintainers? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Um, no, um, not yet. So this is one of the big things. I actually had a slide in here on metrics and took it out because I just didn't have enough to say about it. Um, I think this is one of the biggest things that we are working on at NASA and elsewhere, um, is how can we actually measure open science? Because only then can we actually incorporate that into our reviews of hiring, promotion, tenure, you know, all of these things. So uh, again, my theme of I'm not answering the question. I guess I answered the question. The, an the question answer is no. Um, but yeah, would love to hear thoughts on this, um, if you have any. Yeah. A really interesting talk. Uh, one question I, I had was, I, I guess the idea of what the community thinks. I wanted to jump into that a little bit more. Um, because some, I guess one, one concern I run into sometimes, especially being involved in like certain d different communities, is that the, the, sometimes the people that dictate what the community thinks tend to be power users or developers or and not necessarily the broader base of all the different users and uh, and people at different experience levels. So I, I know you, you've already mentioned through like things like TOPS, there's already a number of efforts going on to try to solicit more uh, voices from the community. But I was wondering what, if you have more general guidelines of understanding what the community truly thinks and how to solicit feedback from, especially from groups that don't normally speak up 
to and how that how that should influence governance decisions on these on these big software projects. That is a very very good question, and again, I don't necessarily have a good answer yet. Um, I I mean the main thing I can say is you know if. Being, getting involved in the communities is the best way to know what's going on. You never know everything that's going on. I've been involved in Pangeo for a while, and people will still say, oh, what is this Pangeo thing? So, oh, I didn't know we did that. Um, so, you know, and that's, I think that's okay. Um, but, um, you know, having, so if you know your university, your institute, having the employees be really actively engaged in the communities, um, I guess that's one way to kind of get to an understanding of what's going on in the communities. As far as making sure that all of the voices are heard, that's, that's important. To me, that's part of how the community runs. And um, so, um, right, um, I guess that's about community management. Um, you know, how can we make sure that, that it is welcoming to everyone, that everyone has a voice? Um, and part of that is also how do we communicate? So, you know, Pandio is my main example. We have a discourse forum where anyone is able to, to post. But it's important to remember that some people might not feel comfortable posting in a public space. Um, I know that I still struggle with that sometimes. And I certainly struggled when I first started, especially when people would say, oh, you should write an issue on GitHub. I really struggled to do that because I didn't have the confidence of, oh, they'll think I'm really silly. I'm sure it's a you know, dumb mistake. Um, and those are all really valid. So um, to me, that's more of a question of how the community is run, how the community can make sure to foster those, to have different forms of communication so that people can you know, kind of choose what best suits them, um, which is not straightforward, and it does mean that it involves management of the community, where um, it's something we're talking about in Pangeo at the moment of how we can best do that. So, yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question, but <laughs> hopefully addresses it. Thank you. Yeah, that was a good answer. Okay, thanks. I don't know what to do now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, okay, so yeah, we're talking about the open access journals and the absence of that. Um, um, so I guess uh, the question is, so how do you reconcile, uh, you know, uh, the fact that some science, is, some important science actually, is, sit is still sitting in uh, journals that are not uh, open access so with, the, with the current efforts? So do we recommend that scientists actually, you know, focus on only open access journals and perhaps risk uh, uh, you know, uh, the visibility of their research and so, you know, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I guess my, my answer for these kind of questions right now is that we are in a transition phase. And I really like to see the nuance in open science. And so uh, generally, my, again, my NASA hat is not on, my personal take. Um, is not to, you know, say, if you didn't publish open access, then I won't read your stuff, I won't cite you, um, which might be the case if you literally can't access it, and that's fine. Um, but that we are in this transition phase. Um, the most recent paper that I published was not open access because we did not have the funding for it. And so even though I was like, oh, this is really important, I didn't, I didn't want to pay several thousand dollars out of my own pocket uh, to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, to me, it's, it's less on the, on the individuals. I think we need to have this come more from the top. I'm talking about more grassroots, you know, uh, bottom up. But I think some of these really need to come more top down and make sure that it's really not a burden on the users, on the scientists themselves, to have to fork out the money for this. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting, of, you know, maybe we should try and have, you know, some more policies that say, well, if you don't publish open access, you won't get cited. Um, but actually, we don't even need policies. There are uh, studies that show that, that if you publish open access, you get more citations. 
And if you make your code, you know, like a direct link to a code repository, you also get more citations because people will cite your code, uh, your data, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I, I think that this needs to come more from the top. We need to have this, uh, um, think about the publishing framework and kind of update that, which I think is coming, um, but slowly. Um, this question. Oh, do we? Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so I had kind of a follow-on question to the first one, um, building on the kind of the importance of um, creating a diverse and inclusive community and how that can be challenging. Um, I guess so. You spoke a little bit about kind of community management and governance and how that plays into their uh, like into kind of that goal, but. Um, I guess I'm curious if you could expand on that and maybe talk about some of the resources and or that requires and or like metrics that should be there mm. to make sure that I we're doing that. that. <laughs> um, that's a good question that I, I'm not sure I can really answer that um, off the top of my head. Um, but these are things I'm interested in, in really discussing and, and knowing more about. Um, but community management is, is becoming much more popular, so there is a lot more out there about how to, how to best do this. And of course, um, you know, science and open source are global communities, so we have all sorts of different types of diversity that we're thinking about, time zones, um, access to resources and the internet, and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I don't think I have any specifics um, for you, but would be happy to, yeah, brainstorm and discuss uh, later. This question is from Helen Kershaw. I'm curious about NASA's policy to only require software to be open after publication. This seems restrictive for community development. Are there plans to make development open at NASA? Yeah, um, excellent point, yes. So when I was showing some of the policy um, uh, details, um, so what actually is saying is like the code that you use does have to be shared when you publish your paper at time of publication. Um, I see it sometimes as something different. If you write, you know, some code that's not really in a package form, it's not really going to be shared as a, dis, you know, package that can be distributed. Um, that's kind of like the code that should be shared so you can rerun. Um, there's also like open source software packages that are really developed, um, you know, often in collabor and collaborative forms. Um, that is absolutely. So one of the other um, things at NASA, and there's still some red tape around this, but we're, we're slowly getting there, is, sorry, talking to you, I realize you didn't ask this question, um, uh, to, uh, um, absolutely, where basically our advice is from the start, go through, there's a big NASA, um, you know, set of rules that you have to kind of get through and these, you know, steps to get your data, uh, sorry, your um, software to be open. And once it is open, then it is open, uh, open source. So once you get through all of those steps, it is open source and can be worked on collaboratively. Um, I have not done this. I have heard it is rather cumbersome to get through these steps, and I recognize that. Uh, and that's where I think there's a little bit of disconnect where we're saying, yes, this is what we're doing, and we're trying to figure out then what those steps should be. So again, we're in a transition phase, but that is, that is the advice. I should also say, my NASA colleague, JL, is here. Please chime in if you have any, anything more to say on this. So JL's really working on some core services side. Yeah, to, that is a question that we actually get a lot, especially from people who have been already working for years on a project that has existing software that has not been open. And they're like, what do we do? I, the software I wrote for five years is running on my laptop, and that's what it's designed to do. And I think for now, something is better than nothing, so making it available is good enough. But really, we would encourage that if you're starting to write new software, you think openly about how you develop it. Yeah, thanks. In your role as, of uh, promoting open science practices, uh, I was wondering if you could speak to the, the pushback you might get from working scientists around embracing these practices and what kinds of, of, of reasons, I guess, or you know, what their concerns are. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, I mean, one of the fun things about this job is we are going out and talking about open science to a lot of different people. Um, and so we do get, you know, really the full, the full spectrum of people who are like, yes, open science is awesome. And others who are like, hmm, I'm skeptical or I'm frustrated. Um, 
So um, a lot of the concerns we get are, um, I mean, some of the ones I mentioned here, um, you know, it's hard to navigate like the open source software system, ecosystem. There are just there are a lot of a lot of tools. Some of them aren't maintained. It's kind of hard to tell which ones, especially if you're not used to the kind of using GitHub and you know all of these things. So especially for new users, um, a big one that we get a lot is you know by sharing everything, then someone will just use my um, you know my science, my code, my data without you know crediting me, and then you know they might you know, get a publication or get a grant that uses my stuff. And so, you know, kind of this like scooping, which I think is a really, really valid concern. Um, and uh, one of the things we like to talk about is kind of a distinction between, um, you know, being collaborative. I mean, that is kind of part of the science that we do is we do share ideas. Um, while we do kind of rely on people being really nice about that and, you know, giving co-author or, you know, thanking the acknowledgments uh, or whatever or to give some credit. Um, versus just kind of um, research misconduct, which is, you know, taking someone's idea knowingly and then using it without giving them credit or, or without involving them. Um, and I think a lot of those concerns are valid. They're valid in the open science space, but they're also, there's there are still concerns now. So I in my mind, I don't see open science necessarily as being too much more of um, a concern. It's something we have to address now as well. And then it, will hopefully translate to um, to later. Um, yeah. Do you have any other thoughts of what other, you, you know a lot more on the NASA side of um, what people are opposing to <laughs> open science, <laughs> what concerns they have. I, I would actually say I was very surprised, pleasantly surprised, because I thought there was going to be a lot more pushback. Um, with Paige and I started quite recently in this, and, and it, given my, my experience as a researcher in astrophysics and planetary science, th there were a, lo a lot of people who kept their code, especially their code, and even their data very close to their chest. But I think on, on the whole, there hasn't been that much pushback. The, there are concerns, and I think that the being scooped is one of the, the biggest concerns. Um, but I think that people are also concerned because they're thinking of how things have been until now where there has been no recognition to having, making your data open or your software open. But I think once it's, it starts being valued and recognized, and if you can say, I wrote this package of software that's been used in 100 PhD theses around the world, that that will be valued. Whereas I think 10 years ago, it'd be like, well, yeah, but how many papers did you publish? That's really what we're counting. Yeah, I think it's this, this transition phase, and we just need to make sure we have metrics so that people can get the credit that they need. Um, I guess the one thing, other thing I'll add is, um, you know, we get I get a lot of people who are like, oh, I'm really on board, but I've been using MATLAB or X proprietary software, and it just takes a lot of time to switch. And I think my opinion might differ from some of my NASA colleagues. I my opinion is, you know, it time is really valuable. If you don't want, you know, if you don't feel able to switch. I think that's okay. We're in a transition phase. I think we should be, you know, from the start, we should be teaching more open source and that kind of thing. But, you know, we're, we're all kind of doing the best that we can. And I, I think that meeting people where they are is absolutely the way forward. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. A really great talk. Thank you so much. Uh, so I had a quick question. You mentioned that there is a lot of encouragement toward like publishing the data and publishing the software, basically, besides the, the paper. And a lot of journals uh, have that requirements, basically, um, to have the software available. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask is that it's, uh, and this is something that I've noticed, that a lot of people like include a, either like a GitHub repository or a zip file, basically, with their paper. but. If you really like go into that zip file or if you really go into that software, there is either like some piece that's missing or there is either like some piece that's not working, no documentation. So what is, I was wondering, like what is basically the general consensus about like reproducibility of the results and also like the, like, so for, for example, the papers, usually someone re reviews the paper, so it's like peer reviewed paper, yeah. but no one's gonna review the software. Maybe the reviewer take a quick look, but are they gonna run through it? Who's gonna run through and make sure it's working? So the quality and the reproducibility of the results is not um, guaranteed, um, even though the code is online and the data is online. Yeah, 
Uh, this is a, a big concern. Yeah, I feel like we really moved quickly in the share everything, but not how to you know, verify everything. Um, so, I mean, for a lot of people, open science, the main driver of open science is reproducibility, which, you know, is what science really set out to be, reproducible. That's, you know, a kind of a main tenet of our science. Um, and so now we're kind of, we have these questions, but it's not necessarily really easy. It's just saying, oh, we'll just make sure that, you know, we'll just add another reviewer that reviews the code. But that actually can be hard. You need to have the right environment. So they need to make sure that they have, you know, the, the correct environment to run it, that they have access to the data. A lot of that takes money, you know, if you don't have, you know, a computing system, like, how do we do this? So there are a lot of questions about that. Um, there are also a lot of discussions around the reproducibility side. So someone um, who um, works at, in the UC system in California um, is teaching a class now where all of the, the graduate, I think graduate level class, where all of the students have to go through and try to reproduce a paper. And, um, you know, I don't necessarily think this, this is the answer, but uh, that what, what he's finding is that it's really useful whether they can reproduce it or not. First of all, it's good to know, so the scientific community can know that. Um, but it's also really useful for the students because they're learning a lot because they're really diving in and trying to figure it out. So there are also talks about, you know, how can we, you know, maybe it's not at the review stage. Maybe the paper is published, but um, I'm really throwing out random ideas here, so don't. <laughs> Don't take this uh, as anything that has happened or will happen. But um, you know, maybe we can have some sort of measure of this paper has been reproduced x number of times. Uh, this one has not, or this one has been, but we had to make an assumption that they used this software. Or, you know, things like that where it might be helpful. Um, you know, especially yeah, like for for us as as consumers to know, oh, this one's been verified by like 200 people. It's probably pretty robust. Um, so anyway, these are some ideas. Again, not really answering it, but um, these are definitely active discussions uh, across the community. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. And let's thank Dr. Martin one more time, please. <laughs> and, and thank you all for attending.